Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 34. Today's guest is Michael Waldridge. He is a professor and head of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. He is an expert on multi-agent systems and has published more than 400 articles about them, plus nine books, including the more popular Ladybird Expert Guide to Artificial Intelligence, more about that in the interview, and The Road to Conscious Machines. He has received the Lovelace Medal from the British Computer Society and is an ACM Fellow and AAAI Fellow, among many other distinguished credentials. His new book is A Brief History of Artificial Intelligence, and it is published by Flatiron Books and has just now gone on sale. We're going to talk about how AI has progressed, ways of judging AI against standards of artificial general intelligence, and the challenges that AI faces in dealing with the real world. You will hear Michael talk about supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Those are two of three categories of machine learning, the other one being unsupervised learning. And I explained those three approaches in the last episode when I got into practical explanations of how AI works. If you're not familiar with those terms, you might listen to that episode first. Anyway, let's get on with the interview with Michael Waldridge. Michael Waldridge, welcome to the show. It's a great pleasure to be with you. So we live in interesting times at the moment, and I was watching a, I think, Oxford Union debate where you were speaking, and that evokes that quote because you were saying you'd been doing artificial intelligence for something like 30 years and by and large had been left relatively well alone until about five years ago when the phone started ringing and there was a a large amount of interest. What do you think precipitated that? So the story is literally true. I was sat, I mean, this is 2014, and I was sat in my office in uh, University of Oxford, and the phone rang, and it was the BBC, and they said, this is Stephen Hawking. They said, um, Stephen Hawking says, um, artificial intelligence may be a threat to the existence of the human race. And then I, th- I can't remember if it was before or after, but the similar thing with Elon Musk making this, this similar statements. Um, and I was just kind of slightly startled by this, I have to say. So where did it come from? Why did it happen? I think the last 15 years or so, since around about 2005, but really since around 2012 or so, we've seen very rapid progress in one tiny little narrow piece of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a very, very, very broad church, but there's one piece of it that we've seen real rapid progress. And that area is machine learning and a particular technique has come to prominence, a technique called deep learning. And with deep learning, we can now do things in AI that we thought were probably, you know, decades into the future. By no means did we think they were impossible, but we didn't think they were imminent. And so uh, one of the first real breakthrough moments was image analysis. And there was a competition in 2012, and there was a sudden moment where there was a step change in the capability of image analysis, which kind of really startled everybody and opened everybody's eyes. But here's the thing. Those advances have been in a really narrow, narrow, narrow sort of area. But the problem is you hear about computers that can be any human being alive at the game of Go or chess or whatever. And you talk about superhuman intelligence in the game of chess or Go. And that leads you to conclude quite naturally that we must be on the edge of some kind of intelligence explosion that we must be near the dream, right? I mean, if we have computers that are better than human beings or all these different things, then surely the grand dream of AI must be in sight. And that, I think, is what, that's where Hawking and Musk uh, and many, many others were coming from. We've seen this huge progress. Surely this means that now things are going to progress very, very rapidly. And so that, I think, is what drove that flurry of statements by Musk and Hawking and by many, many others around that time. Mm. And Hawking, of course, from my alma mater of Cambridge, Musk was reportedly driven by a book from Nick Bostrom, a philosopher at Oxford. 
Have you run into each other? Uh, yes, we don't know each other closely, but certainly we've run into each other. Uh, and it's a great, fun book. I mean, I think it's not just about AI, the book Superintelligence, which I believe it was a New York Times bestseller, fascinating book exploring the idea of how not just AI, but the many different ways that kind of super intelligence might be achieved. It's a rollicking good read, I think. It is. And I think it's important to point out that it proceeds from the assumption that super intelligences exist. It says postulate, not that they exist now, but it's say postulate that we have a super intelligence. And then what happens if that is true? And, and that leads to a number of dire conclusions. Of course, the big assumption there is that we have super intelligences. They spell it out. What's left unsaid is how long would it take before we get those and no one knows. It does lead me to feel frustrated that we don't have perhaps the best vocabulary for describing these kinds of problems. That computer scientists for years have anthropomorphized their code as people anthropomorphize anything that they work on, from farmers going, oh, this stupid tractor doesn't want to start. We do that with our code as well and quite naturally say, well, this program doesn't think X, this program doesn't want to do Y, or it prefers to do that. We anthropomorphize it that way. It perhaps provides some sort of comfort when we're developing it to have a virtual thing to virtually kick when it's not doing what we want, perhaps. But that inevitably leads to problems when we're talking about things that encroach upon domains where we thought it would take our level of thinking, human level of thinking, to solve the problem, and then we solve it another way. Do we need better ways of describing what we're doing in artificial intelligence? I think you've hit on a very good point. I mean, I think I would paraphrase that and say that one of the issues in AI is that we don't all necessarily agree on what we're talking about or indeed on what the goals of what we're trying to do are. So the kind of the AI that Bostrom is talking about is often called a general intelligence or artificial general intelligence, AGI. And the AGI, even within the AGI community, they don't necessarily agree on what AGI is because it's kind of a nebulous idea. But roughly speaking, it means if we succeeded with AGI, then we would have artifacts that have the full range of intellectual capabilities that a human being would do. So roughly speaking, any kind of intellectual task, and by intellectual task, I just mean anything which involves a task which involves a kind of human brain, we would have machines that could do that. So AGI would mean that we would have a single machine that could tell a joke, interpret a story, recognize faces in a picture, invent a story, write an essay, critique an essay, cook an omelet, uh, tie a shoelace, uh, ride a bicycle, drive a car, go swimming, you know, or anything that a human being could do, a, a machine could do. That's kind of roughly the AGI goal. Now, crucially, the AGI goal doesn't say anything deeper about what they're like, actually going on inside those AGI devices, right? So it's not claiming that they are conscious or self-aware or sentient or anything like that in the same way that human beings are. It just says that we have machines that can do all of those things. And there's an interesting sort of philosophical debate to be had about those fine distinctions. But the problem is, I say, there is a community, the AGI community, but for them, that is their goal. And some people, Ben Goetzel famously, is probably the most outspoken international advocate of that idea. And Ben thinks AGI is imminent. I absolutely don't think AGI is imminent. And I could talk in a lot more detail about why I don't think it's imminent. But yeah, to go back to your original point, I think you're absolutely right. We don't really have the vocabulary to describe what it is that we're trying to do. And there are so many different viewpoints. Nobody owns AI. There are so many different viewpoints. And that does cause endless confusion within the field. I think what's startled me the most is what we might be actually the inverse of what we're claiming for artificial intelligence becoming generally intelligent is that maybe a lot of what we thought we were doing when we were thinking smartly is not as brilliant as we used to think. Douglas Hofstadter famously said when Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, he said, my God, I used to think playing chess required thinking. Now I realize it doesn't, <laughs> which probably wasn't intended as an insult to human chess players at the time. But before then, people had thought, well, if we get something that can play chess as a computer, then it would have to know about strategy and uh, attacks and these sort of high-level abstraction patterns of thinking that humans use to solve chess because you couldn't do it otherwise in a computer. Well, it 
it did. And then they thought the same about Go and it did solve that, but without being generally intelligent. And now we have things like GPT-3, which are carrying on conversations at quite a level that I would have said before couldn't be done. The limitations can be exposed, but I want to go on record actually as being the first person to say, my God, I used to think that passing the Turing test required thinking. Now I realize it doesn't because we may be that close to something like that. So has this revealed that a lot of what humans are doing can actually be imitated quite well with general pattern recognizers? So I think there's two parts to that question. I mean, so I'll come on to the GPT-3 part in a second. So if you look at the Go playing programs or AlphaGo, you know, it's a wonderful achievement. I mean, really, really, really wonderful achievement. I genuinely believe that. So what's actually going on is we've got a program which is just optimized to do one tiny, tiny, tiny narrow thing. It is literally a program which is just highly, highly, highly optimized with a huge amount of compute power behind the scenes to train uh, to train this program and a great deal of software engineering going into it. There's a lot of human expertise in there. Even if it's not Go expertise, what it's doing is it's giving it the facility to learn Go and that facility is coming from human beings. There's a huge amount of that engineering and then that training that goes into that one tiny little narrow thing. But, you know, AlphaGo doesn't know it's playing a game of Go and the generalizations of it that, that subsequently followed, AlphaZero and so on, you know, they don't know that they're playing chess. They can't explain anything to. Essentially, all they're doing is a program which is highly optimized to take some input, which is the current board position, and to choose a particular output, which is your next move. I mean, and that's literally it. And a huge array of current machine learning programs are basically doing exactly the same thing. So there's an example that appears in my most recent book. You look at a picture. I so there's a picture of uh, of the actor Matt Smith who played Doctor Who in the BBC TV shows. And you look at the picture and a human being, and I ask you what's going on in this picture. And the, the, the picture is actually of Matt with his arm around another gentleman who happens to be my great-grandfather-in-law. Now, in his pocket, Matt's got a rolled up sort of roll of paper in his hand. He's holding a paper cup and he's wearing a kind of overcoat over his outfit. Now, anybody looking at this picture, if I say, what, what's going on in that picture? They'll immediately tell you, well, that's Matt Smith, the actor who's, who plays Doctor Who. He's probably holding a cup of tea. So he's on a tea break. That thing in his pocket is probably a script. And you can fill in all of that stuff plug that program into a kind of interpret the picture program. All it's going to do is recognize, it's going to produce the text Matt Smith, because that's all it's been trained to do, just to recognize. There's no understanding of what's going on there. I mean, we can use the fact that we know that's Matt Smith to be able to make all sorts of other inferences or hypotheses about what's going on in this picture and fill in a very, very rich picture around that. The program can't, because all it's optimized to do is just say Matt Smith when it sees that picture. And so many other machine learning programs that do impressive things in their own right, that's all they're doing. They're just optimized from looking at some input. You know, a driverless car just looks at the input that's from its from its sensors and together with some inbuilt logic of the driving logic is optimized to produce the, the right decision about what it's supposed to do. There's no attempt there, and there's no claim, for example, in Alpha Zero that it's supposed to be understanding what's going on. That's not the point at all. It's just supposed to win at a game of Go. It's just supposed to be able to produce that mapping from the input, the current state of the board, to the to the output, the move to make in the best possible way. And it does that very, very successfully. So the GPT-3, let me move on to the GPT-3. So GPT-3, again, it's a, it's a wonderful achievement. I'm a bit skeptical about the Turing test thing. I think you don't have to dig very far to discover that GPT-3 is a kind of, um, you know, it is genuinely a wonderful achievement, but it is, you don't have to dig very far to discover its limitations, let's put it that way, and to expose the fact that actually, once again, all that it is producing what appears to be very coherent text, it doesn't go very far. It's actually not very, very deep in its understanding. So what I would say is when you look at those sentences that are being produced by GPT-3 and you say, well, oh my God, you know, it understands poetry or something like that. No, it doesn't. All the understanding is coming from you. Right? So let me make that really concrete. So GPT-3 was roughly speaking trained on every text that's out there on the World Wide Web, right? They threw all of this stuff at it, right? Everything that they can get their hands on. So in amongst all of that, millions and millions of source texts, there will, I dare say, have been omelette recipes, 
So it will have read probably every omelette recipe on the World Wide Web. So I haven't tried this and I should try this, but you can try it later if you want. Ask it about omelettes and it will probably tell you a good story about omelettes, right? Does it understand omelettes in any sense whatsoever? Absolutely not, because your understanding of an omelette comes from the fact that you're in the real world and you've experienced breaking eggs and whisking eggs and making omelettes and eating omelettes and that great omelette I had in Paris in 97 and all the other experiences that you've got. When you see the word omelette, right, what it denotes for you, what it means for you is all those experiences. And so your understanding of that symbol, omelette, derives from all of that stuff. It's not just some of your understanding, for sure, comes from books, right? You might remember a memorable passage in a novel where somebody eats an omelette or something like that, but your understanding of it is grounded in the world. And GPT-3 has none of that. What it's learned is, and it's learned in a very sophisticated way, is a whole bunch of relations between that word omelette and other words. And it's learned that in a very, very rich way. And I'm sure people will do useful and very clever things with it, but that's not the same as understanding. And I think one of the worries that I have about GPT-3 is, again, people attributing to it too much. I would never consider using GPT-3 in any kind of real world situation that actually required, you know, I wouldn't trust it to make a decision on whether somebody should get a bank loan or how to operate, what the cause of a particular disease is. It doesn't have that kind of understanding. All it's trained to do is to try to convince you that it's producing something plausible. Or to put it another way, and this is not original, this isn't mine, it's a very grand autocomplete feature. Like on your phone, when you're typing a message and you're getting suggestions about the next word to appear, GPT-3 is that just take it up kind of two orders of magnitude. And I say, it's a wonderful achievement, but it is not artificial general intelligence. And for the reasons that I've just described, I don't see any kind of understanding in GPT-3 whatsoever. Right. Now we're knocking on the door of philosophy. We should probably leave that unopened uh, at the moment. But my understanding, GPT is essentially like Markov chains on steroids and all of its computational horsepower is going into increasing the size of the sliding text window through which it makes these connections. And that's following some kind of exponential or hyperbolic thing in that to add a few more words of context is going to require doubling the number of of, of parameters it has. And we've kind of gotten sucked here into the threat conversation about AI. And that one does tend to take the oxygen out of the room whenever you get into it. But I'd like to set that aside for the moment because otherwise it just dominates everything. And visit some of the other work you've done because I looked at the books and we'll get to your latest one in a moment. But I see in your previous books, you wrote The Ladybird Guide to Artificial Intelligence. And that will have immediate meaning to listeners in the United Kingdom for those elsewhere. When I was growing up there, the Ladybird series of readers was ubiquitous and for children and were things like Ladybird guide to puppies or firemen. Maybe the brand has expanded its depth somewhat, but tell me about that experience, what you were trying to achieve and uh, what the results were. Yeah. So yeah, as you say, I mean, for those of a certain generation, I mean, roughly speaking between around about 1940s and 1980s, the Ladybird series in the UK was a very, very big series. And the readership of it went from uh, kids that were learning to read. So a big part of the Ladybird series was, was, was about books that were designed to help kids learn to read, but it went right through to sort of teenage reading level. And I mean, there are all these famous anecdotes about, I mean, you know, there was the Ladybird book of the Crusades and you know, there are all these anecdotes about students that had missed all their lectures on the Crusades. And, you know, everything they knew about the Crusades actually came from the Ladybird book of the Crusades, which they just filled in with other general knowledge. So these are quite short books. There is a story about their origins were in kind of wartime times of austerity and there wasn't that much paper available so they were quite a small form factor but actually as a side effect of that you could carry them in your pocket and they were hard bound so they lasted and actually they last very very well you can go on ebay and there are many ladybird book collectors they're very short and they each come with illustrations so they're about 25 pages and uh, uh, Penguin, who are the Ladybird, is, a, is an imprint of Penguin. Um, they decided to relaunch this book series about four or five years ago. And what they wanted to do was to present serious subjects in a kind of non-threatening way. 
So if you're interested in, for example, climate change, and the first book in the series was by Prince Charles with some other authors, like Emily Schuckberg and others from Cambridge, you know, you could look at a thousand page book in your bookshop and maybe you'd buy it and maybe you'd read it or maybe you wouldn't. And the idea was the Ladybird books are very unthreatening and kind of entertaining. And the idea was that you, in the, with this rebooted series, was that you'd be able to absorb enough about a serious subject without it feeling like it was a, a chore or that you're having to battle your way through. So when they launched this series, I'd actually already signed up to do my longer book, which is also with Penguin. Um, and they kind of approached me and said, well, look, we've got this rebooted series and we know that you hadn't signed up to do a Ladybird book, but would you be interested in doing one? So I, in my youth, as I'm sure you did too, I had a large pile of Ladybird books. I mean, they were the kind of things that lazy relatives would be able to buy at the last minute for birthday and Christmas presents without having to think too much. And it was a very safe bet because you knew you weren't going to get anything too dangerous and so on. So I had piles of these. And it, the series meant a lot to me. The, the Ladybird book on how to build a transistor radio, I treasured that. The radio never worked, but I, uh, I treasured the book. So I just loved the idea that there was this classic series where they wanted me to, and it's an entirely serious book. It's not a jokey book or anything like that where they wanted me to try and present artificial intelligence in an accessible way within this classic format. And I'd been thinking about writing a longer book, so my thoughts were already somewhat organised about what I wanted to say. Um, and it was great fun, I have to say. But actually, it was an amazing discipline to be able to try to distill a huge field down into that format. But then the other thing that I discovered was that they commission, uh, they commission illustrations specifically for the book. And the illustrator that they commissioned for mine, I assumed it was going to be an impoverished art student, you know, and they'd pay them, you know, uh, $5 an illustration or something. Uh, but actually they commissioned Stephen Player and Stephen Player uh, illustrates Terry Pratchett's books. So I was slightly startled to discover that, that somebody uh, whose name and whose illustrations I was sort of very familiar with was there doing it. So it was a wonderful achievement and uh, a wonderful experience, I should say. And I've had great feedback on it. And if you want a very accessible, non-threatening, very non-technical book, which explains, I think, some of the big ideas in AI, so the Turing test and the Chinese room and, uh, you know, the threats about AI, it talks about those. You know, I'm genuinely proud of what we managed to achieve. It's a, it's a, it was a great experience. Well, thank you. I'm going to look for it now. And what age range is it targeted for? So it's essentially for teenagers and adults, but actually the book series itself is really aimed primarily at adults. And I say adults who who want to learn about something like quantum physics or climate change or, you know, certain elements in history. There's a great series on the Second World War as part of the, the rebooted series who want to learn about this in a way that's not going to be a drag. You know, that's something that you could just spend a couple of hours that's reasonably cheap. I mean, it's more or less the price of a pint of beer in my local pub. So there's not a great outlay there. And I think for me, the main thing is it's kind of non-threatening. You're not going to be daunted by a Ladybird book. Nobody was ever daunted by a Ladybird book. Excellent. It reminds me of experience I had. I was talking to a middle school class and actually not about artificial intelligence, but about space exploration. Middle school is like 11, 12 year olds. And I was saying well, the importance of finding out whether life exists anywhere outside of the Earth is really important for it. being able to, well, plug numbers into the Drake equation, but ultimately to determine how likely we are to be alone or not in the universe. And we were talking about different aspects of life and going up to the scale of intelligence, because that's one of the variables in the Drake equation. And I said, can you have life without intelligence? Well, of course you can. Yes, numerous examples of that, some of them in politics. And I just thought, well, let's turn it around, see what happens. Spur of the moment, I said, can you have intelligence without life? And they all looked at me like, duh, of course you can, and said, yes. I said, what's that? And again, they gave me the duh look and said, AI, all of them. They're growing up with an understanding of AI as a part of their world that I certainly didn't have when I was a kid, except in the realm of science fiction. And of course, in science fiction, those things were arbitrary amounts of time away, hundreds, thousands of years. And so promoting the understanding of that at that level, I think is very important. And let's talk about your latest book, Brief History of Artificial Intelligence. What were your goals with that? 
So uh, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, uh, the BBC phoned me up and said Stephen Hawking says artificial intelligence might be the end of humanity and so on. And there were a series of similar announcements and people got quite alarmed. And I think from the point of view of the general public, the, the, the world's most famous scientist saying we should be concerned about this, naturally people are going to be concerned. Now, I have lots of concerns about AI, but the headline ones, I mean, I'm not losing sleep over the robot apocalypse. I don't see that on the horizon anytime soon. I think there are things that we will need to think about going forward, but I don't, for the same reason that I don't think artificial general intelligence is coming anytime soon, I don't lose sleep over the robot apocalypse. So what I really wanted to do was to reframe the narrative a little bit. I mean, firstly, actually the truth is, and this is It's a slightly controversial view, I suspect, but actually for me, artificial general intelligence, actually the truth is it is not really part of the mainstream of AI at all. If you go to the big AI conferences, the NeurIPS conference, the Neural Information Processing Systems conference, the ICML conference, International Conference on Machine Learning, IJCAI, the International Joint Conference on AI, there's a vanishingly small number of papers there, scientific works on uh, artificial general intelligence. That's just not where the action is. That's not where the interest is. The interest, as I said earlier, is kind of on focused on these quite narrow problems. But these AGI type concerns are the ones that get the press excited. You know, every single press article about AI, there is a picture of uh, usually a female robot, you know, with the kind of the ex machina type female robot missing the back of the robot's head or something like that or else a Terminator type robot. I mean, and that's what that's what everybody picks up on. So I wanted to tell the story of AI. Look, what is AI? What is AI actually for the people that actually do artificial intelligence? And how do they think about it, right? I mean, this is such a big problem. You want to build an intelligent machine. How do you go about doing that? What are the main ideas that drive, that have driven AI? And actually the truth is, I mean, there's a joke at the beginning of the book, you know, that it's the story of AI through failed ideas. And there are quite a lot of failed ideas. There are a lot of ideas that didn't really kind of work out. So I want to reframe the narrative away from the kind of the Hollywood, either dystopia or utopia kind of visions towards the reality and to draw attention to the issues that I think are the issues that we should be concerned about over the next couple of decades. And they are very real and very serious. And actually, they're affecting us now. I mean, these are issues that are biting now, that are having consequences for real people right now. And these are the issues that I wanted people to be aware of. And then finally, the last part of the book, I just wanted to have a bit of fun. So I do, in the end, sort of, we go into the kind of the can machines be conscious type questions? What would that mean? What would it look like? And so on. And we very rapidly discover that it's very difficult to talk about those issues. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we can't resist that, I know. And since you brought up AGI again, I'm going to quote from DeepMind's page, their homepage. They state their goal is, our long-term aim is to solve intelligence, developing more general and capable problem-solving systems known as artificial general intelligence. So they go right there. Maybe they don't publish that many papers at NeurIPS uh, with that in the title, but they're not shy about saying where they want to go. No, and I would be the last person to downplay the achievement of DeepMind. I mean, many colleagues, good friends who work for them and they're doing amazing research and they've really, I think they push back the frontiers in many ways. I mean, I think what I would say is the DeepMind approach to AI, if I had to characterize it, is to take a technique and show that it works on one particular problem and then to generalize it to related problems. And so the classic example is the AlphaGo and then to AlphaZero. AlphaGo was a program which was essentially trained to to, to play the game of Go. And they then did this wonderful generalization of it that learned how to play chess. And the statistics were staggering. I mean, I think after seven hours of self-play or something like that, albeit with very large compute resources behind the scenes, you know, it learned to play sort of world-class games of chess. So that generality of approach, I think is that, I have no problem with that whatsoever. I mean, I think that's a really, really interesting goal, but that's a long, long, long way from AGI. And so let me just, I mean, briefly, if I may, just say a little bit about why I'm a bit of an AGI skeptic and I don't see it on the cards anytime soon. So I'm 54 years old. I've been on this planet for just over 54 years. And uh, throughout that entire time, I have been learning right about the world and how to inhabit this world and how to occupy this world and succeed in this world. And that involves both the physical environment 
right? That when I drop things, they fall to the ground. And also about the social environment. I inhabit a world that's full of other human beings. And I have to navigate my way just as much through that world of human beings as I do the physical world, right? Um, to succeed in this world, it isn't enough to know that when you open your hand and drop something, it falls to the ground. You have to be able to understand other human beings. And that's more than language. That's about understanding other human beings as fully realized agents with their own goals, their own beliefs, you know, their own desires in the world. But actually, when I was born 54 years ago, just over 54 years ago, that child was the result of billions of years of essentially nature doing reinforcement learning, where nature was experimenting with different mutations, with different genetic variations of my ancestors over billions and billions and billions of years. And there were many, many dead ends in that process. There were many of my ancestral lines sort of died out along the way. There were many failed experiments. But what nature finally delivered in me is an organism which is in part trained to be able to inhabit this world. I was born with some innate skills to be able to inhabit this world. But more than that, I was born with the ability to learn how to inhabit the world, both the physical world Right? and the social world, the world of other human beings. Okay, the current techniques on for AI don't have any of that. And the headline technique, deep reinforcement learning, if there is one characteristic technique which has been championed by DeepMind, it's deep reinforcement learning. Uh, and they've proven it very, very, very successful. Here's how it works. And I'll use an example. And the, the example is uh, one of their earliest systems, one of their systems that opened my eyes to the success that they had with this technique. And it was an Atari video game player. Okay. And if you can find a video, if you go to YouTube and Google DeepMind Atari Breakout, you'll find a video of their program, Learning to Play the Game of Breakout, the classic video game from the 1970s and, and early 1980s. And it uses reinforcement learning. And basically the, what it does is it just starts out. Nobody tells it the rules starts out by experimenting, just moving its controller left and right and seeing what happens. And occasionally in the game of breakout, you have to bounce the ball up and knock bricks out of the wall when you get points. So it knocks a brick out of the wall. It sees it's done something good. And what reinforcement learning does is says, ah, I've just done something good, which means the next time I see a situation like that, I'm more likely to do that thing because it led to a reward for me. I, did, I got some points. And over time, just using that, and that's hiding a huge amount of sophisticated mathematics and algorithmic tricks to be able to do that learning, it learns how to play this game famously in the case of Breakout, absolutely optimally. Okay, so reinforcement learning, it's wonderful for that, and it's then gone on and they've demonstrated that in a number of other settings. Problem is reinforcement learning doesn't really work in the real world. Why doesn't it work in the real world? Well, you can't train a driverless car by using reinforcement learning. Of course you can't, because you can't you can't put a car on the road and let it try to learn how to drive safely. It just doesn't work. You can't train a robot butler or a, a machine to make omelets even, right? You can't do that in the real world. Reinforcement learning is really, really, really limited about what it can do in the real world. And I say, Mother Nature, we are the result of reinforcement learning over billions of years where Mother Nature has ruthlessly experimented with our ancestors over a, a countless generations. You know, some of it's, I'll try this, says Mother Nature, and it's gone hopelessly wrong, and that has been wiped out by Mother Nature. We are the result of all of that process, and then 54 years of essentially supervised learning in the real world, where we were born to be able to learn about the physical world that we inhabit on planet Earth, Right? and the social world that's full of other individuals, other agents, people like you and me. So I don't think somebody writing GPT-4 and running it on their laptop or their cluster or whatever is going to achieve what Mother Nature did over billions of years. You know, if you are disembodied from the real world, you will not end up with human-like intelligence. I just don't see that. But you can do reinforcement learning in simulations of the real world, like Tesla does with their Dojo supercomputer. A lot of the learning, the training of autonomous vehicles is done through simulations and where you can crash. That's absolutely true, but highly abstracted simulations, right? I mean, it's not experiencing the world in the same way that you or I experience the world. It's, it's viewing a highly stylized 
abstracted version of reality. Mm. And for all of the time and all of the money that they've spent, we still haven't seen, despite Elon's promises to the contrary, we still haven't seen level five autonomy. And I think most serious commentators think that we're still quite a long way from level five autonomy. So certainly you can do simulations, but it's actually quite hard to simulate the physical world in all of its richness, the the raw reality that we all experience from the moment that we're born. Yes, I'm actually in the camp of the people who think that we're going to need an artificial general intelligence before an autonomous vehicle is safe enough on the road, which disappoints me because I have a Tesla and I really want it to be able to do <laughs> what... Oh, believe me, I would too. <laughs> uh, Elon said. Yes, this interview is being split into two episodes because we had such a terrific exchange. It went on for far longer than we should try and fit into one download. One more reminder that starting on February 10th, I will be giving my five-week-long continuing studies course through the University of Victoria. You get 10 hours of live instruction with slides and videos and discussion about what artificial intelligence is doing to your world for the bargain price of nearly 100 Canadian dollars. But thanks to the pandemic, you don't have to be in Canada to take it. You just have to be online and awake. Here's your last chance to sign up for it because it starts in a couple of days of the release of this episode at 6 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday, February 10th. Go to continuingstudies.uvic.ca and search on artificial intelligence. It'll be the first course listed. A question from listener Paul, who writes in to say, I am listening to episode 17, that's the second one with Roman Yampolsky, and at 6 minutes and 30 seconds into the podcast, you name a list of human attributes including free will. Has science shown conclusively that humans do indeed have free will, or is the debate between free will and determinism still going on as it has for millennia? Short answer, yes. This is a great question. And aside from some very metaphysical discussions about the quantum nature of the universe and the direction of time's arrow, as far as I'm aware, science has shown nothing of the kind. You're talking about things that are well within the realm of philosophy and Philosophers are not under the gun to provide any definitive or rapid answers to that kind of question. They're really not used to working on deadline, let's put it that way. It's interesting to see how much philosophy overlaps with computer science when we get to AI. That's why I've already had one philosopher, Corinna Vold, in episodes 14 and 15 on the show, and we will have more, because she and other philosophers found themselves in great demand when AI started raising questions about ethics that landed in their laps. Paul goes on to say, If neither free will nor determinism have been conclusively proven through scientific inquiry, then I would state that either one is only a belief and not a fact. Now, I would agree with you, Paul, although I'm not an expert on that topic, so my approach is to find experts and interview them. I take the same position with respect to what we call consciousness that it is a belief, not a fact, and it may not be a real thing in the world at all. That consciousness is a thing we all think exists, but since no one can define it except in circular terms, maybe it really doesn't exist and we're all just fooling ourselves. Someone who is an expert on that topic is Daniel Dennett, and if I understand him correctly, he's saying the same thing. So free will and determinism sound like what Pamela McCorduck said in episode 22 that Marvin Minsky described as suitcase words. You have to unpack them to find out that they really mean 10 or 12 different things. Now, humans have been debating free will and determinism for thousands of years. Remember, I said that philosophers aren't in a hurry. But when AI starts achieving agency, we may need to come up with answers to those questions faster, for their sake. So philosophers, get your pencils sharpened, okay? Thanks, Paul. I saw something recently about a study called the GIANT study. That's an acronym, but well-chosen one, because it looked at the genetic contributions towards people's heights. What makes tall people have tall kids? And it concluded that there were 700 variations in genomes that each contributed towards height, maybe a fraction of a millimeter each. It takes some fancy math to get at that, and it illustrated how modern thinking, I did not know this, is that genetic traits aren't the product of one or two genes being flipped somewhere, like one spot in your DNA deciding whether you're a blonde or a brunette, but that the traits are the product of maybe thousands of genetic variations working together. 
This poses a massive problem in analysis, of course, but it occurred to me that it's the sort of problem that machine learning would excel at solving. And I bring it up because they didn't see any mention in the paper that they'd used it. I wonder if there are any geneticists listening who can comment on the use of AI in analyzing genomes. In today's headline, ripped from the news about AI, Dr. Kenneth Urish and others at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and Carnegie Mellon University College of Engineering have created a machine learning algorithm that can detect subtle signs of osteoarthritis. Too abstract to register in the eye of a trained radiologist, on an MRI scan taken years before symptoms ever begin. These results are published in PNAS. That's obviously pretty useful. So one of the major advantages of artificial intelligence and its pattern recognition skills coming to light. In the next episode, we'll conclude the interview with Michael Waldridge. We'll talk about what an agent is and how one could help you what a multi-agent system is, and how agents communicate to reach agreement on their individual goals. We'll talk about bias and ethics, where and how AI works very differently from how you and I solve problems, and consequences for environments like financial markets and avoiding flash crashes. All that and much, much more, because it's a truly wide-ranging, fantastic discussion. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Crisis of Control and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's AI. A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.